good. Okay, so I'm gonna do like quickly introduce my work and what I do, and then uh, Kyle will, I guess, do the same, and we'll talk about more about this collaboration we've been we've been doing together uh, this week, maybe for the past uh, ten days. Uh, we've been down in the uh, octave. Which is really, really exciting space, really complicated space, but yeah, loads of really interesting potential. Uh, really quickly, I'm gonna um, explain explain you maybe why I'm so in love with video projectors. Um, my my background is more like graphic design. I was I was making um, uh, uh, websites and anim animations, and at some point I started. Um, using a projector to just show my work on a larger scale. So I, I did um, a couple of VJ sets in clubs in Bristol, where, where I'm still based. And then at some point, I realized that with the same projector I was projecting, using to project on screens, I could also project onto uh, um, three-dimensional uh, structures. Like in this case, it was just a little uh, piece of origami in my, my bedroom, and I, uh, the projector was just off-site. But, uh, I, I could use light really precisely to light up the, the object. It's really, it was yeah, very basic at the time, but um, after doing this very simple thing um, in my bedroom, then I took the projector through my bedroom's uh, window and onto the neighbor's um, facade. So it's really super dark. I think I'm missing a colors as well, but I, I use the same technique just to light up the, the windows and the doors and um, put a little video on, on, on YouTube, I think, at the time. And I was writing on a blog, and I found other visual artists that were, that were also interested in this idea of projecting onto three-dimensional structures and projecting light into space. And uh, that's how I met uh, Yannick Jacquet, uh, also known as Legoman. That was his, his nickname at the time. And uh, he was doing this really exciting installation called 3 Destruct, where basically it is, um, uh, he made this three-dimensional display, which is just uh, netting, like mosquito netting or ghost, and using four projectors to just um, animate the space, but not just on a flat surface, but in, in three dimensions. And, and it was actually quite immersive. You could walk inside and, and really be surrounded by lights. And I think that's uh, at this point I realized that I didn't want to uh, to, to go back to uh, flat screens, but I was more into uh, yeah projection in, in three-dimensional space. So with a few other friends, we started uh, the label NTVJ, and we started doing uh, installations and projections onto uh, different types of structure. This is an installation I did at MPAC, where Kyle. Uh, that's where I met Kyle as well. It was, it's like a large drawing on a wall. And I'm um, just reprojecting, just mapping the drawing to uh, animate it. Uh, we've been doing a couple of uh, projection mapping projects over the past few years. Um, and um, yeah, that's one of them. Uh, we, we've done the, our first like permanent um, project in Poland. Uh, but the next thing I wanted to show is, yeah. So when uh, after starting projecting in three-dimensional space, I realized I was also very interested in ways to kind of um, trick the mind and like play with the audience perception and uh, a few years ago I did this experiment that um, yeah it was very much an experiment it didn't quite it wasn't quite stable but it was um, a head tracking system and a stereoscopic projection and it never really went anywhere it was more like a like a test and and I realized I quite like the idea but I never had a, another opportunity to uh, to to work uh, with stereoscopy properly and and that's um, when Elliot got in touch, and we, we were starting to talk about the Screen Lab residency, and uh, and I met Kyle um, a couple of years ago, and then I had a chance to go to New York um, to see him last, uh, like early earlier this year, and Kyle being very much into experimenting as well, doing research and development. I think that was the the first day when we when I arrived. I remember. Um, you, you don't, I think you don't have a PC, so you couldn't try this new Reconstruct Me software. So the first thing we did is like get together to like scan ourselves, and, and we did this, uh, this funny kind of 3D model. And, um, and yeah, there was like an obvious connection or like so, something. Uh, something that, uh, yeah, from that point, we thought it would be interesting to, to do something together at some point. And, uh, and Elliot um, had this idea of doing the residency, so I guess that's how it all started. And I think Elliot mentioned like a few options. Um, obviously, at, uni at this university, there are many, many interesting bits of technology, and the Octave was one of these. And we got really excited uh, about the idea of doing like a very immersive environment using stereoscopy and tracking system, and um, sound field, um, and and yeah, 
quite quite a few bits of technology that uh, seem to be a, a bit complicated to uh, to use properly. But I think with the, the help of Elliot, we we managed to uh, to make everything working. Uh, oh well, we're still like a work in progress, but we got the the, the tracking and the stereo and all this working. Maybe um, um, you want to. So basically, maybe some some of you came to see the work in progress this yeah, afternoon. Who, who came to the octave earlier? Anybody? Okay, great. Like half the audience. That's awesome. Cool. That's great. So for the people who weren't there, the octave is the space. Um, what what's the name of the other campus in the Newton Building? Say it again. I I can't pronounce Peel it. Peel Park. <laughs> Sorry for my American accent. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so we've been spending a lot of time over there. It's kind of 14 projectors, uh, eight projectors in the round, and six coming from the ceiling, and then 120 speakers that are kind of surrounding the entire space. Um, uh, the speakers can kind of cause sound to uh, kind of acoustically appear from any location in the space. And uh, when you're wearing these shutter glasses, uh, stereo 3D shutter glasses, um, you can get the perception of like seeing an image anywhere in the space. So it's kind of like having a holodeck um, where you can make anything appear and anything, you know, sound a certain way. Um, yeah, and actually the one of the biggest problems when we got there was that there were so many possibilities that we didn't know where to start. Um, so we started kind of building up this construct of uh, kind of different inspirations for virtual reality like spaces um, where we started thinking about kind of really simple geometric forms and using that as an inspiration um, for a kind of piece that we're working on um, that's a sort of interactive experience involving um, platonic solids as like the building blocks of virtual reality. Um, and uh, that was the way that we started to structure all of the work that we were doing was picking these um, kind of uh, classical Greek primitives and then um, associating them with sounds and colors and uh, elements um, and then using that to, uh, to kind of guide some of the kind of aesthetic decisions we were making and uh, kind of help limit the technical problems that we had to solve. Um, so this is kind of a, like a wireframe mock-up of the space. Um, you can see kind of how the projectors are arranged around the space. Um, it's about uh, six meters uh, in diameter. And uh, yeah, so we were, you know, after we started thinking of some kind of interesting things we could allow people to interact with in the space, um, we both got kind of hacking in our own respective environments. Joni works a lot with an environment called VVVV or V4, and I work with a toolkit called Open Frameworks. Um, so we started sketching up kind of lots of different um, sort of designs for spaces that might be interesting there. Do you want to show some? Yeah, uh, so I've got where, when we got there, we started. Uh, started put, yeah, putting patches together and like comparing how we would work and how we can breed, we could bridge our work between uh, open frameworks and v4 and uh, we got really excited because uh, Elliot managed to uh, to port like uh, it's, it's that's going to be the really geeky part uh, but uh, v4 is based on um, uh, an, uh, uh, structure structured around directx and basically you can't really uh, interact much with open frameworks because it's based on OpenGL, but Elliot managed to do like a little bridge, which is great for this project, but also for uh, the future of, of both communities because then the idea would be uh, to like, yeah, interface both softwares and, and work in collaborations with, uh, with yeah, multiple people coding at the same time. So we got really super excited. We started patching things around, uh, playing with shaders and, uh, and uh, just like prototyping things really quickly. Um, Kyle's probably gonna show us um, really yeah, I'll, made some I'll channels. I'll show a few too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and so we started started doing that for the first few days, but then we realized that the the octave, the space we are in, uh, has a few constraints. Um, like the computers that are running the the space, they're not. Um, I think the space was was made about five years ago, so we had to keep that in mind in the way we would develop the shaders and also um, how we would control all the different computers and make sure everything would be in sync uh, and it was a, a bit more complicated than we saw because it has yeah so many things like the tracking uh, the perspective calibration thing uh, the stereoscopy and yeah yeah and, and, in a way we kind of like I it was kind of naive to step into the space and say yeah we're gonna make this crazy installation involving that's interactive and involves all these elements oh and by the way while we're doing that we have to figure out how to interface this uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds 
uh, head tracking system to our code. We have to get all of our code talking to each other. We have to figure out how to integrate this wave field synthesis mm -hmm. software into our system. We have to do sound design that makes sense in a spatialized environment, which is completely different than doing sound mm -hmm. design yeah. for headphones or for speakers or anything. We have to figure out like <laughs> you know what shaders are actually supported on these graphics cards. So like we yeah we could have spent probably like another two weeks still yeah. just yeah. solving technical it's an problems. <laughs> playground just to be in this kind of space and and be able to like plug and play and try things around and uh, we had some kind of custom trackers made yeah. Uh, yeah. to be attached on the on the legs so you could actually track where people step on the floor so we had loads yeah. of crazy there's so many so many possibilities we mm. kind of got distracted by the potential <laughs> Um, and also, so um, I've, I've me been meant to do that for ages, but I think I'm going to release most of the, the shaders and uh, the different uh, things I'm going to show there. Um, most of the creative community here and, and around are very much into uh, sharing patches, and I think that's, that's a big influence on me, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll probably put most of the stuff on GitHub um, as soon as Cal shows me again how to do that. <laughs> I always get confused. So if you were in the Octave earlier, then you didn't see any of this because um, uh, it's some of the OpenGL stuff that we couldn't quite um, get on the Octave space in time. Um, but one of the ideas was that you would kind of um, step into this uh, step into this like empty space like kind of classic virtual reality space where anything is possible and you know you see the outline of the octave at first but then it kind of melts away um, we really wanted to like go for all, go all out with all of those like vr tropes um, and then when you kind of walk towards one of these platonic solids it draws you in and then suddenly the whole space transforms into this uh, kind of tunnel that takes you to a completely different landscape um, we were watching a lot of like star trek and contact, contact. <laughs> and what, what was another one yeah, speed racer. Yeah, yeah. Stun runner. Uh, <laughs> lots. Yeah, it's not Tron. Didn't watch any Tron. <laughs> uh, yeah, Joni still hasn't seen Tron apparently. Uh, yeah, surprise. Um, yeah, so there would be a lot of different kind of styles of tunnels. Some of them would be kind of uh, self-intersecting. Um, some of them would be these kind of bundles of like confusion where you just feel like you're racing through and tumbling around. Um, some of them are like very minimal and elegant, um, but they're all completely different. Um, another idea that we were working with was um, a, a floor that kind of uh, drew on Joni's background with projection mapping and doing this drawing, augmented drawing. Um, we wanted to kind of have a floor that would like be a bunch of um, triangles that would kind of ripple as you walked around. So we started by making some um, some of these effects that. You know, whenever you disturb the surface, um, it causes ripples in the surface. Um, and then we started mapping that onto, um, uh, let's see, mapping that onto this uh, space that would kind of be sitting on the floor. So whenever you took a step, then you'd cause this kind of ripple to emerge. And you see these triangles kind of come and spike out towards you. Um, so this, uh, this kind of, Prototyping uh, was really useful for like aiding the kind of creative direction that we wanted to go, but um, in the end, it was just a lot of um, you know there were there were a lot of uh, um, because the octave is so powerful, uh, developing for it isn't quite the same as developing for your computer, mm. yeah. um, and there was there's a lot more work to do to get this stuff running on there. And, and I guess we got so excited about different ideas that we might have to split that into a, into a couple of projects as well. Because and so it's just crazy. Like, even ju just with the yeah. sound and the web yeah. web synthesis. Yeah, so like just today with the sound, we finally yeah. got kind of all of the sound working together so that we can have Joni sending me positions to place things in space. So we can have kind of like this object floating around in space or something falling or whatever. And then there's also a sound that appears to be coming from that location. Um, and like we only got that working together today. So it was part of our original concept, but um, uh, we've been developing both kind of the technical, solving technical problems and kind of creative and aesthetic problems uh, in parallel, and they both inform each other. Um, yeah, and then sometimes we're just like finding um, kind of like technical, like super, super technical problems. Like how do we make something that looks a certain way but runs in real time. Like this is kind of traditionally a hard problem to make things that are shaded this way. It's called ambient occlusion. Um, but we thought of a, a neat trick to make it look this way. And sometimes when you're developing this, then you kind of write one of one of your lines of code is wrong, and you get something that looks you know really cool, but 
completely not what you were looking yeah. for. <laughs> so we were like talking about yeah. how to make good 3D clouds yeah, a couple exactly. of days ago, and then made by mistake, accidentally, by accident, we made 3D we, we clouds. This one. So yeah. Um, yeah, and then sometimes there's little experiments, like uh, Joni had a drawing in his sketchbook of um, kind of this tetrahedron meteorite, and I thought, oh, that'd be great. We need to have like tetrahedron meteorites raining from the sky <laughs> for our fire element, which is the tetrahedron. So uh, we started doing some sketches like this, um, and yeah, lots of other things. You want to show a couple more, and then we'll yeah. wrap it up? Yeah, unfortunately, none of this is uh, currently in, in the Octave, but we're going to work a bit more uh, over the next few days to uh, have as much of this as possible and, um, and uh, make it, yeah, hopefully show it in the more immersive environment. That doesn't, oh, right, okay. Uh, how confusing. Mm -hmm. So this is just, yeah, this, this um, it's kind of a collection of shaders that I've put together quickly to prototype things. And is this working? It takes a little while to load, and um, yeah, it was a lot faster on my computer than it was in the space, but uh, I think that's, so it's, uh, uh, it's a kind of real-time generated landscape with um, just a depth map, so the nice thing is, and, and everything can be animated. And uh, so yeah, it was more, more sketching, so the, um, in this case, oh, it's all, <laughs> everything at the same time now. So it's, uh, yeah, this kind of landscape with some, some more like blocky aesthetics uh, as well. So this was, yeah, so this was one of the landscapes we were going to have. There's a, I, I think I just saw some snow a second ago. Was that there? Yeah, so one of, one of the elements was water and we were trying to figure out how to integrate water like that we had some ideas about snow and rain and uh, and liquid and uh, um, kind of ripples on the ground and um, uh, yeah this was it was really interesting effect to see just kind of particles floating in space in the, in the octave so and I think like another effect we found completely by mistake was the what we call the kind of Akira effect where everything uh, kind of explodes and like in the Akira movie if you've seen it it goes like this like this kind of explosion from the middle. And I really want to see that in, in the space, like being in the center and like everything kind of rippling away and the whole space kind of uh, uh, shaking that way. So that's, yeah, hopefully we could make that working. But at least, yeah, we made some, we had some really exciting accidents and, and found out a lot about, uh, about the immersive environment and how every, everything works. And also we realized how much the camera calibration and the perspective transform is so enhanced and, and uh, complicated in, in, in this kind of environment. So, um, so yeah, we've learned a lot. And, and yeah, we're really thankful to, uh, to the whole team, to uh, Kit and Elliot, and uh, also to John, who helped us uh, all week, and, and to all, all the team uh, uh, at Salford University. And Absolutely, and I also want to say a special thanks to Ian and to George for helping us with the sound. I don't know if you're here right now, but yeah, thank you. The, um, one of the most exciting things for me about this project, I come from like a sound background originally, um, and then I got into interactivity um, through kind of making non-traditional instruments. Um, so one of the most exciting things for me about the octave space uh, was the wave field synthesis system. Um, and, uh, you know, traditionally it's used for playing back uh, pre-recorded things that you kind of walk in and you can hear this interesting sound environment. Um, but both Ian and George kind of got us set up um, getting real-time input into the system so that we could, you know, send whatever we wanted to to the space. I could sit in the middle of the space and kind of listen what it sounded like to have sounds kind of floating in different places. Um, and yeah, that was really exciting. So thanks to both of you as well. Yeah, and to everyone, thanks. Thank <laughs> you.